Welcome to the 80th Theoretical Physics Colloquium by Professor Sramayi Sen from Iowa State University. She received her PhD in 2015 at the University of Maryland College Park. Uh, afterwards, she had uh, two postdoctoral positions between 2015 and 17. She was a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Arizona, not far from here, uh, but not here. Uh, between 2017 and 2019, she was a postdoc at the University of Washington in Seattle. Since 2019, she is an assistant professor at Iowa State University. She has a re relatively wide research interests in nuclear physics, physics of strong interactions, quantum chromodynamics, quantum phase transitions, topological phases of matter, methods of effective field theory, and perhaps some other things I'm forgetting right away. So uh, today she will be talking about index theorems, generalized whole currents, and topology for gapless effect fermions. And with that, I'll give the microphone to Sri. Uh, thanks, Igor, for uh, that introduction uh, and also for organizing uh, this colloquium. So um, as you can see from the title of my talk, I'm going to talk about uh, gapless uh, edge fermions and some concept of concept of generalized Hall current uh, in such systems. And so this work um, uh, was done in collaboration with David Kaplan. Um, and uh, the paper uh, is hopefully gonna come out in a week or two. Uh, so keep an eye out if you're interested. So um, those of you who know my collaborator uh, will not find this surprising that we are working on edge states seems to have an affinity towards uh, edges of mountains. So it's not surprising that we're working on it. So that's the picture here. Um, so so the, the, what I'm interested in, or I, what I'm gonna focus on in uh, this talk uh, are uh, systems, fermionic systems um, in space times with boundaries, which can host, uh, massless fermions. So here are some examples. Uh, so the first one on the left-hand side you see is uh, a two plus one dimensional bulk fermionic theory, uh, which is one plus one dimensional uh, edge. Uh, and uh, you can have uh, massless fermion edge states there. So that typically describes the physics of quantum Hall effect. Um, and also, if you are familiar uh, with the idea of domain wall fermions uh, in uh, four dimensions um, embedded in five dimensional space time, that's uh, sort of a higher dimensional analog of what I'm drawing here. Um, then you can have um, what is known as a three dimensional topological insulator. So here I have a bulk uh, three plus one D system uh, with two plus one D surface, and you have again surface. Uh, states, massless fermions on the surface. Uh, there is this, the other picture here is uh, that of a one plus one D dimensional vortex string in a three plus one D bulk system. So again, you can have um, chiral fermions on this one plus one dimensional vortex string. And here you have a zero plus one dimensional vortex defect in, in two plus one D bulk, okay? So these are, various possible uh, massless fermionic edge states that you can have. Uh, these are some of the examples. So here is something nice about um, the one plus one dimensional uh, chiral edge states uh, embedded in two plus one D system. So let's for now uh, focus on the one plus one theory. So here, what I'm drawing is the spectrum of massless fermions uh, in one plus one D. So the x-axis is the momentum axis and y-axis is the energy. And what I'm showing here is uh, sort of the derivation of the anomaly. So we know that you know, in one plus one dimension, we have um, um, anomaly. So if I apply an electric field, for example, in this system, um, uh, I have the right and the left moving branches of fermions, the right moving fermions and both the left, both right and the left moving fermions uh, start moving um, in the direction of the electric field or opposite to the direction of the electric field because of the charge. And so as a result, uh, you see that um, the energy of the right-handed particles go up and same 
uh, happens for the left-handed particles. So as a result, um, you create an imbalance between the right and the left uh, 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 population. And so the rate of change of that population is related to the electric field, and that's really the derivation of the anomaly, anomaly pressure. And those of you who are familiar with the chiral magnetic effect, for example, you know that such a system also has a current, and that also is proportional to the electric field. Uh, it's really the it's really proportional to the population difference between the right and the left moving particles. So the current is also proportional to the electric field. Now, uh, if you had a system where you had just a right moving or a left moving fermion, um, then uh, you would in general uh, be in trouble because uh, that theory uh, when coupled to electromagnetism is inconsistent because uh, charge is not conserved, for example, uh, you know, because the right moving fermions, for example, keep going up in, a, in the presence of an electric field. So one way to make this theory consistent is to put this theory um, in, um, in a higher dimensional uh, um, theory. So that would be, um, for example, if you attach it to a two plus one D bulk system, um, then everything uh, becomes consistent. So, um, so that's, you know, that's what I'm describing in this slide. So here, for example, I have a two plus one D uh, Lagrangian of a Dirac fermion. So this is the bulk theory uh, where I want to embed this uh, one plus one D um, chiral fermion system. So um, if um, so, it turns out that this uh, relativistic quantum field theory um, of uh, Dirac fermions actually describes uh, the physics of quantum Hall effect um, very well. So um, in this picture, what you see here is that uh, I have a domain wall in the Dirac fermion mass. And in the region where the mass is positive, uh, that region describes uh, the quantum Hall sample. And outside uh, of this region where the mass is negative, you have vacuum. So the domain walls in the fermion mass uh, describes the edges of the of your quantum Hall sample. So um, it turns out now if I apply an in-plane electric field in the sample, um, an in-plane electric field that is parallel to the edge of the of the uh, sample, then there is current flow uh, in the bulk uh, towards the um, uh, walls, and there is a current on the wall, and so as a result you have current conservation. So the thing that I was describing here um, that if you have uh, one particular chirality of fermion in a one plus one D system, um, uh, you, you're in trouble. Uh, the trouble is, uh, you know, it goes away if you if you place it in a in a higher dimensional theory. So let me describe it to you in a little more detail here. So that's what I'm doing here. So let's say uh, the edge that I'm interested in, um, uh, it's in let's say x one direction, uh, x two is the direction in which I have uh, the x two is basically transverse to that. So it's transfers to the domain wall. And so um, the bulk theory is what I showed you earlier. What you can do uh, in order to understand what happens in the bulk uh, is, um, you know, you can, first of all, turn the derivative here into a covariant derivative. So you couple it to a gauge field. And let's say you integrate out the fermions uh, inside the bulk because they are massive. And so that will leave you with an effective field theory for the gauge field. So it goes as this, so it's a chern simons theory. And um, now um, what you could try to understand is, you know, what, what happens to the physics of quantum Hall effect. I'm, this, I'm telling you for a, for a while now that this describes the physics of quantum Hall effect. So you might as well compute the current uh, from this theory by extremizing it with respect to the gauge field. And you see that this is the expression for the current. And now if you have a background electric field, which is let's say in the X1 direction, you find that there is a current in that is, that is transverse to the, to the wall. And it goes as the electric field itself. And on the wall, if you solve the Dirac equation in the background of this uh, domain wall, you would find chiral fermions. So on one side, you would find right moving. On the other side, you would find left moving fermions. And so they would carry current along the edge. And so you would see that current is conserved. So that's what I mean when I say that this is a 
we have a nice current uh, conservation picture um, for, for the system. So um, this would uh, allow you to actually anticipate the presence of uh, chiral fermions on the boundary without even having to look at the boundary. So you could just look at the bulk and see the current, and that would tell you that you must have something on the boundary that conserves the current. So, so that's, um, uh, that's what uh, I think is a very nice feature of uh, this one plus one dimensional systems in the boundary of, on the boundary of two plus one D systems. Uh, however, such a picture uh, does not exist uh, for uh, a lot of other kinds of uh, massless fermions on boundaries. So for example, if you have um, um, a three plus one D uh, bulk system with two plus one surface, you can have uh, massless fermion edge states um, on the surface, uh, but in two plus one dimensional uh, systems, there is no concept of um, right moving or left moving fermions. Uh, so the whole uh, picture of current inflowing from bulk and being conserved on the on the wall it just breaks down. There is nothing, no analogous picture. Similarly, you could take um, the two plus one D domain wall theory that I showed you, and you could add a uh, um, fermion number breaking term to the Lagrangian, which looks like psi psi, for example, and that would break fermion number down to Z two, and you will lose. Uh, Fermion number current, you lose the concept of, you know, it, there won't be any chiral, continuous chiral symmetry to talk about either. However, if you actually solve the uh, system in the background of a domain wall for the fermion, Dirac fermion mass, which is this one, uh, you would see that uh, your chiral edge states are still stable. They are still there, except that the whole argument in terms of the anomaly uh, actually doesn't work anymore. So, um, so this is something I'm going to actually discuss in the later part of this talk. So I will uh, postpone uh, its discussion, but um, let me instead um, discuss this three plus one D system a little bit more. So, um, so in the three plus one dimensional, dimensional um, topological insulators uh, with two plus one D surface states, you can also, you can also describe those uh, using domain wall uh, fermions. So here you just write down a relativistic three plus one dimensional Lagrangian of Dirac fermion. And let's say you add a, a, a step function and a domain wall in the Dirac mass. Um, and on the surface, right where the domain wall is, you would see two plus one dimensional mass of fermions. So here I'm just trying to draw the spectrum. Of course, I am not drawing uh, both momentum axis, so I will have not just one uh, momentum axis, I'll have another one which I haven't drawn. And so I'm just drawing the energy and the momentum here. So it's just the right moving and left moving uh, concepts are not there anymore. Uh, however, you still have a massless fermion. And so the question is, is there a way um, that you can relate the existence of this massless fermion to some kind of uh, current inflow from the bulk? So that's what we are trying to do here. So um, if you look at the spectrum here uh, for these massless fermions, um, you could pick a random state uh, on uh, on these branch on these two branches, and uh, what you can say about the state is that it's a zero eigenvalue eigenstate of the Minkowski uh, Dirac operator. So the fact that you have, um, you know, these states um, and that these, you know, branches actually pass through the origin, that's a consequence of the fact that you have massless states. And so really what I want to do is I want to get a number out of, out of this feature, right? So I have a bunch of states and I want to describe all of this with one number. Um, so I really want to count the fact that I have one fermion, one massless fermion. I really want to get the number one out of this. So how do I do that? Um, so we just, you know, one way to do it would be to count any one of the states here. Um, and so that would mean that we have to somehow be able to isolate one state from the rest of the states. And so the way to do it is, you know, to go to Euclidean space. So you go to Euclidean space and then you have the Euclidean Dirac operator. 
And in that case, what happens is that most of, the, most of these states, which are away from the origin, they are not zero eigenvalue eigenstate of the Euclidean Dirac operator. But this one at the origin still remains so. So you could count that one. Okay? So that's why I'll go to Euclidean space and uh, uh, start doing the analysis there. So, so that's, the, that's sort of the first step um, towards what we are trying to get. So, so this is what we want. Uh, so we want a current inflow picture for the not nice ones as well. By not nice ones, I mean the, the theories where you don't have this uh, chiral anomaly on the edges or some kind of current inflow uh, from the bulk. So we want to create a picture uh, for uh, current inflow for those kinds of systems as well. We will use the index of the Euclidean Dirac operator to, to do so. And the, uh, the corresponding current that we will find, we'll just call it generalized Hall current. And so this is going to be present irrespective of what symmetries of the original theory uh, we had or whether there was a chiral anomaly on the defect or not. So in order to do this, uh, in order to construct such a picture, uh, let me, um, Let's first look at the one plus one D domain wall in two plus one D system more carefully. So here I'm drawing the same picture again. I have this uh, relativistic uh, um, quantum field theory Lagrangian describing uh, this two plus one D system. So um, if you were interested in finding the massless edge states uh, living uh, on, on the domain wall, uh, you would just go and solve the Dirac equation. And since I'm interested in the, in the massless states, I would just impose this condition that on the boundary, uh, you know, I have uh, this partial one minus sigma three partial two goes to zero. And um, the rest of the equation is just the solving the Dirac equation, okay? So psi is the, the wave function that I'm solving for, and you can solve it uh, using separation of variables. Um, and um, so after imposing that the partial one minus sigma three partial two goes to zero, I'm really left with this equation, which involves uh, just sigma three partial three and the mass of the Dirac fermion. And what you can see is that um, if you were interested in normalizable uh, eigenstates of this operator with zero eigenvalue, it's the off diagonal term, uh, uh, on the top right corner that has a zero eigenvalue eigenstate that's normalizable. The other one doesn't, which is at the bottom left corner. And as you can see, what you see here is this partial three um, times the Dirac mass, uh, sorry, partial three plus the Dirac mass. I, if I call that operator D, uh, the other off diagonal operator is just D dagger. Um, and the solution looks like this. Um, so, what you see here is that D has a normalizable uh, solution with zero eigenvalue, but D dagger doesn't. So um, what you can say in this case is that the fact that you have one chiral fermion living on the wall corresponds to the fact that D has one eigenstate with zero eigenvalue, which is normalizable, and the fact that D dagger doesn't. So if you were to count the number of zero eigenvalues of D, and subtract off the number of zero eigenvalues of D dagger, counting only normalizable states, that would tell you how many chiral fermions you have on the wall. So now this, um, uh, def, you know, this thing that I described, which is the number of zero eigenvalues of uh, D minus the number of zero eigenvalues of D dagger, that's the index of the operator D. Uh, and we are going to use that um, in our construction. Uh, so here, um, you have to uh, take my word for it that the index of the operator D, you can write in terms of the following formula. So uh, it's a trace of this, uh, this uh, difference of these two operators. M is some scale. If you take M to zero, uh, this ends up giving you the index of D. Now you can rewrite this formula in, term, in terms of two other matrices. So in terms of this matrix K and this gamma chi. Um, and um, as you see, uh, the dimension of K 
uh, is twice the dimension of D and same is the case with gamma chi. So D for me, if you were just counting Dirac indices, it had like a one dimensional matrix. So if you count Dirac indices, K is twice the dimension of D and same is with gamma chi. So now this is in the, you know, I, I described all of this uh, for uh, two plus one dimensional domain wall fermions um, with this one dimensional operator. But let's say, you know, uh, I want to now uh, use um, some kind of fermion operator. Let's say I want to use a fermion operator here instead of this operator. And why do I want to do that? Well, I told you earlier is that I want to count this state, right, which is the zero eigenstate of a Euclidean Dirac operator. So um, this is related to the index of that operator. Um, so I could very well take this formula and stick in uh, a Euclidean fermion Dirac operator, and that would give me the index of that operator. So I'm going to stick in that D, the edge states of which we are interested in. So um, what happens in that case is that, you know, I have the same kind of formulation. I write K in terms of these uh, D and D daggers, where D is the fermion operator. And what you see here is that one over M plus K that was appearing here, that itself looks like a fermion propagator. So you can now write, imagine writing a theory uh, of the following form. Um, so you can describe or you can compute this trace in a path integral formalism where your, your action looks like the following. The psi fields are uh, spinners which have dimensions twice that of your original spinner because I have doubled uh, the dimensions here of your original spinner. And uh, this is the corresponding Dirac operator of this new theory. Uh, the number of space-time dimensions, however, is the same as what you had before. So it's like I have introduced an extra dimension, except that my fields do not, do not depend on this extra dimension. So this is the theory, and you can compute a path integral here um, to evaluate this trace. And what does this trace look like in this, in this new theory? Well, it, it's just this, right? So this is the fermion propagator. So, th so I just have psi bar gamma chi psi. That's what I have to evaluate in this new theory. Now, if you look at this new theory, you will see that it has symmetries, right? So it has its own uh, fermion number symmetry. And in the limit of m going to zero, it also has a chiral symmetry. So, um, you know, we have, we have what we wanted, um, first of all, uh, which is that we wanted to create a current inflow picture. So we are going towards that with this. So now at this point, I'm gonna contradict myself a little bit and you'll see why um, in, a, in the next few slides. So I sa said that I wanted to count the zero eigenstate um, from, the, from the Minkowski theory and you could do it by going to uh, Euclidean space. But even though you have the zero eigenstate, zero eigenvalue eigenstate doesn't mean that it will be normalizable in general. Uh, so what we will have to do uh, is that we will have to turn on diagnostic background fields in order to uh, make the modes normalizable. So they have, we have to localize these modes and then we'll be able to uh, relate it to the index of the operator the Euclidean Dirac operator is only non-zero when you're able to uh, localize the modes. So if you do this, then every time there is a massless edge state in the Minkowski theory, you'll, be end, up, you'll end up with a Euclidean theory with non-zero index for the Dirac operator. So, um, so here is uh, a little more detail about the double theory. Um, so this is the action. The, the gamma matrices of this theory are double the size of the original ones, and you can just read them off from this operator itself. But formally, you can write them as this. You can define an axial current in this double theory, and it looks like this, and it has a corresponding Watt Takahashi identity. And it looks like uh, what you would have expected from the Fujikawa calculation, for example, uh, of even dimensional. Uh, uh, um, 
uh, axial currents uh, conservation equation. Okay, so that it just looks like that. Um, the A that I have here, uh, it comes from the variance of the path integral measure, which Fujikawa calculated uh, in his paper for the first time. Um, so in these theories, in these double theories, it turns out that uh, this contribution uh, ends up being zero. So I will keep dropping this term from now on. But as you can see, I showed you earlier that uh, this is the index, right? Um, and so I'll be able to relate the index with divergence of this new current. So this is what we wanted. We wanted the divergence of a current. Uh, we wanted the wanted the wanted to relate the index of the operator, uh, Euclidean Dirac operator, to the di divergence of a current. So that's what uh, we have been able to uh, do. So so how does um, you know this work in the most uh, simple example, which is the vanilla domain wall. So we'll take um, the, the standard domain wall fermion, one plus one D edge state in two plus one D background or two plus one D bulk theory, and try to see what this uh, double theory imply uh, for, for uh, this case. And then we'll do the first non-trivial example where you can apply uh, our construction. So uh, in the, in, in, in this example, I, I have, again, I've drawn the domain wall and the Dirac operator uh, D is given by this, D dagger is given by this. So now you can construct the K matrix, right? Of our double theory. So that's where, um, that's where we are going. And uh, so it's just gonna look like uh, zero minus D, D dagger and zero. So that's how the K matrix will look like. Now, um, one question is, uh, what happens to the zero eigenvalue eigenstates of these two operators, D and D dagger? And it turns out that if you actually solved for the um, eigenstates of this operator, you'll see that both of them have zero eigenvalue solution. And you can see from the construct, from, from these entries here. So here, so the mass here, M symbol, that's positive. So this entry is going to give you um, a normalized eigenstate for the operator D and the other entry um, on the other corner of the operator D dagger is going to give you a corresponding state for uh, eigenstate for D dagger. So what's going to happen is that you're with respect to this new chirality matrix gamma chi, you're going to have um, you know, both positive and negative chirality solutions. So you are not able to capture the existence of chiral edge state yet, okay? So we haven't been able to get a non-zero index yet. But the problem is that uh, we haven't also been able to localize uh, our states. So if you look at these states, you know, they are constant in, in, the, in the transverse direction, in the direction of the domain wall. So, so they, they are normal, not normalized yet. So um, what we have to do is to turn on background gauge fields to normalize them or to localize them, okay? So if you are able to localize them, they'll, they'll, they'll automatically be normalizable. So you just turn on background gauge fields and... Um, sorry, can, can I ask you, sorry? Yeah, go ahead. I should raise my hand, I think, I'm sorry. Um, just a very quick question. What happens when you compactify the transverse directions? Then, um, then it would be normalizable, right? Because you would have finite volume. Yes, this is right. Um, but you have to be careful when you are doing compactification because both the eigenstates will become uh, normalizable of D and D dagger. And you might lose the index in that case. Yeah, yeah, that that was sort of the question, right? Because then right, right, right. it would so still indicate that. Yeah, I want to remain in infinite space for now. Okay. Um, yeah, there is a way to do it, even if you compactify it, but uh, right now I don't want to compactify. It. Uh, so, so there is the index theorem, two D index theorem, uh, which says that uh, if you put in a background gauge field, which looks like this. 
um, then B will have uh, localized uh, solutions, but B dagger will not. So um, as a result, now you will have a non-zero index, okay? So we know now that we are going to have a non-zero index. So that means that we'll have a non-trivial current and we'll have, no, you know, we'll, its divergence is going to be non-zero. So we know we're anticipating that if we now compute the, the current, it would give us, um, you know, some kind of current inflow picture. So, um, so with this, we can just uh, go and compute the current, right? It's just the psi bar gamma mu gamma five psi, and we do it in the double theory. And of course, we uh, attach uh, the background gauge field here. Otherwise, the current is just going to go to zero. Um, so this is the description of the double theory. This was my original theory, right? So it was uh, I had two by two gamma matrices here, and you know I had the domain wolf. Uh, in the Dirac map, um, and this is the this is the doubled theory, and the gamma matrices are given by this. And so now you pick this and you compute uh, the current, which looks like this. So it's just I have one gamma mu gamma chi insertion, and then um, this is this gamma nu comes from the fact that I'm attaching a photon uh, leg to the diagram. And so that's really what I'm computing here. This is the K matrix. And uh, one interesting thing that you will notice here is that the, the Dirac mass of the original theory enters like a background gauge field here. Uh, and that's simply because, you know, I'm, I use this D operator and uh, construct the K matrix with D and D daggers on the diagonal. So anything, you know, that appears here, for example, the Dirac mass, it's going to appear on the off diagonal term. So it's just uh, going to enter like a gauge field. So now you can go and compute this current. Um, that's what I do here. Um, and what you see is that the component of the current in directions that are um, uh, along the uh, direction of the domain wall. So that is J1 and J2 happen to be zero. And that's really because of the kind of uh, gauge field configurations that I have used here. However, J3, which is uh, transverse to the direction of the domain wall, uh, that is non-zero. And if you now integrate it over uh, the coordinates, uh, uh, which are in the transverse direction to the domain wall, uh, you get uh, something which looks like um, the space-time integral of the dual tensor, you will note that this has a non-zero winding for the kind of uh, gauge field configurations I took. Uh, and it's also proportional to the mass of the Dirac fermion divided by its absolute value. So now if you computed the divergence of this current uh, and integrate over X3 direction, you uh, get the index, right? and it ends up being one. So, you know, this is what we expected. And so we have been able to get a, a inflowing current um, and the divergence of the, that current matches with the index. So this is how you take the original domain wall theory and you can translate it to this doubled, uh, doubled theory. So now you can apply this to uh, a non-trivial example, which is uh, when you have, uh, let's say I take this same domain wall theory, but now I put in a Majorana mass here. Uh, so this term is going to break U1 symmetry in the original theory completely. So it's gonna break, break it to Z2, not completely. Uh, so I don't have any continuous fermion number symmetry, and I also don't have any continuous chiral symmetry to talk about. So there is no Noether current, um, no conserved current. And so I don't have a, this um, current inflow picture uh, in the original theory. Um, so we will, uh, I will show you that the, the same construction works uh, for this system as well. But before that, let me tell you what happens to the edge states. Um, so let's say you had a domain wall um, in the Dirac mass and you turn on like, uh, epsilon uh, Majorana mass. So the Majorana mass is really, really small. So this 
you know, the, 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 the symmetries are totally um, disrupted, they're gone. But if you looked at the profile of the edge states, if you try to solve the Dirac equation here, you'll see that uh, you still have the wild fermion that you had without the Majorana mass. So they still, they're still there. It's just that in, inflow picture is gone. Um, so, so here is what happens with different kinds of domain walls that you can try. Um, so this is the standard one, right? Um, the Dirac mass is going from negative to positive and the Majorana mass is small compared to the absolute value of the Dirac mass. In this case, you will have one wild fermion on the wall. If you have uh, the Majorana mass larger than the Dirac mass, I'm comparing the magnitudes here, um, then there is no fermion on the wall. And then there is this other possibility where you take the Dirac mass to be greater than the Majorana mass on one side of the wall. And on the other side of the wall, take the Dirac mass, uh, the magnitude of the Dirac mass smaller than the Majorana mass. And so in this case, you will have a Majorana wild edge state. So uh, what we wanna do in this uh, example is that we wanna create a current inflow picture for um, this wild fermion edge state and also for this Majorana wild edge state, okay? Now, the fact that there was no um, uh, current inflow picture for the wild fermion, that was weird. Uh, course uh, in the first place because you know you would think that there is there could be something like this because there's a it could have a charge one so it's a wild one fermion right uh, why it's a it's a it's a wild fermion but um in case of Majorana wild I mean there's no there's no question of a current into it's a Majorana fermion right so now uh what we want to do is we want to go to the double theory and we want to count start counting Majorana wilds and um the wild fermion that we have, it's just a, you know, it, it's two Majorana wilds. So if we are able to count one Majorana wild, we'll be able to count two of them as well. So that's what we are trying to do here. So um, to write down the double theory, um, one way um, to approach this problem is to first see what the wave functions do if you were to solve the Dirac equation in the original theory. And what you see is that, um, the Majorana mass actually splits the fall off of the real and the imaginary parts of the wave function. So for example, in this case, the imaginary part falls off as the difference um, in the Dirac mass and the Majorana mass. So it's exponential in that mass scale. And the other one falls off as the, um, the sum of the two scales. And it happens on both sides. And as a result, you see that um, when M plus, for example, is smaller than mu, uh, one of either the real or the imaginary part will become unnormalizable. And that's how you get a Majorana wild, okay? So, um, so if you now want to count the Majorana wild, uh, you should try to separate out the real and the imaginary parts of this wave function. So the way to do it is to take the field operator and write it in terms of two, uh, real fermion operators, uh, two real fermion fields. I call them chi one and chi two. And now write the Lagrangian in terms of uh, these spinners. So I already now have a four by four matrix because of the fact that I'm rewriting the Lagrangian in terms of these uh, real fields. So now with this, I can go and write down my K matrix and it's going to turn into an eight by eight matrix, right? Because my D is now four by four. And so with this uh, K operator, um, I can again turn on background gauge fields and localize uh, my edge states. And uh, with that, I can compute the current like I did before for the domain wall uh, for me on case. And you, if you computed the current, you would see that it looks very similar to what I had here. Okay, it looks like exactly kind of like this com component, uh, which, ha which had this d squared x uh, integrated over, um, and I had the uh, dual tensor appearing. So the same thing happens there, except um, I had this mass of Dirac fermion divided by the absolute value appearing. 
Instead of that, I have a factor of eta, and I'll tell you what that is. So that's what appears here. So eta ends up being plus one for the cases where the Majorana mass um, is smaller than the Dirac mass. Uh, it becomes zero uh, for the cases where the Dirac, Dirac mass is smaller than the magnitude of the Majorana mass. And um, when the Dirac mass is bigger than the magnitude of the Majorana mass, but it's, uh, it's smaller than the negative of the Majorana mass, then it's negative. So uh, what happens then is that if you look at the, uh, this case, so on one side of the wall, you have a current inflow of plus one, on the other side, you have zero. So you're able to count one Majorana while edge state uh, like that. And here you have a current inflow from both sides, um, plus one and minus one, and you get, you count uh, two uh, Majorana while. So you are able to count one while fermion like this. So what happens is that, um, you know, you have twice um, two units of current inflow when you have a my when you have a while fermion on the wall, you, you have a one unit of current inflow when you, your original theory had one Majorana while uh, in the, on the wall, and then zero current inflow when you didn't have any, any uh, fermion on the wall. So, so this is how you create a current inflow picture for this theory uh, where there, there was no um, continuous internal symmetries. So here are some other examples which you can find in our paper when it comes out. So zero plus one dimensional domain wall in one plus one dimensional fermionic theory. Uh, this is the three plus one D topological insulator with two plus one D edge uh, uh, states, which I discussed initially. Um, this is the other example, which we don't exact work out in our paper, but this also works out. You know, zero plus one dimensional vortex edge states in two plus one dimensional fermion plus Higgs theory. So these are some of the other examples. Now uh, I'm uh, pretty close to ending uh, my talk, um, but before I do that, I want to discuss another curious issue, um, which is that why do Feynman diagrams work in this case? Um, so what do I mean by that is, uh, what, I'm, what I was able to do is to relate the index of the operator um, to some Feynman diagrams, right? Uh, and the question is, well, the index is always an integer. So why is it that Feynman diagram is producing an integer? Um, and you could ask the same question um, in case of your, for example, the original domain wall theory uh, in, in two plus one D um, bulk systems. Uh, so let me uh, quickly recap what happens, you know, what the question there is. So again, this is the original two plus one D domain wall theory. Uh, as I told you, uh, in the bulk, you have a churn simons theory when you integrate out uh, the fermions, which are coupled to gauge field. So that is really a computation, a Fe Feynman diagram computation, right? So you get this um, coefficient of this churn simons term by computing a, 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 a Feynman diagram. And it ends up, uh, being proportional to an integer. So it basically is exactly one over four pi. And so the question is why is, why do you get one out of a Feynman diagram? Uh, and um, just to remind you, uh, you better get one in this case because uh, you had a one, uh, you know, one chiral fermion edge state. So in order to get current conservation, you bet better get a, a one over four pi here. But the, still, the question still remains as to why a Feynman diagram is giving you uh, this one. Uh, and it gets even more interesting if you regulate this theory on the lattice. Uh, what, in that case, what you can see is that if you solve the Dirac equation uh, on the lattice, you would get um, different, different numbers of chiral edge states depending on your lattice parameters. Uh, and uh, you would then expect that your uh, John Simon's theory um, in the bulk better have uh, the corresponding uh, case, right? You better have the corresponding levels to match current conservation. And indeed, if you did a Feynman diagram calculation of uh, this effective Lagrangian, you do see that uh, this K actually takes different integer values as you uh, change your lattice parameter. So the question remains as to why the, you know, this, this, um, 
Feynman diagram gives you um, different integers. And the answer was uh, uh, found in you know, these two papers. Uh, one of them is uh, the paper by Saulus, uh, PKNN paper uh, from 1980s, and then the other paper, uh, which, is, uh, which discussed a similar idea or discovered similar, um, um, the, the, the same answer to the question, in, um, in 1993 by Goldman, Janssen, and Kaplan. Uh, so the answer is, um, I don't have time to discuss it in great de detail, but the answer is that the Feynman diagram computes the winding number of the map. Uh, in this case, uh, from torus to sphere, torus because you are on the lattice. Uh, so the map is from torus to a sphere, uh, and um, this produces, uh, so the, the result of the Feynman diagram is the winding itself, and that gives you integers. So the same is true for the construction in this double domain wall theory um, as well. So what next? Well, uh, one interesting thing would be to do lattice studies of uh, these, um, let's say, odd dimensional uh, systems, odd dimensional uh, edge states, which haven't been done so far. We'll be able to do it now because we have this um, current in flow picture um, in, in this um, doubled theory. So that's one interesting thing to do. Another uh, question that I'm uh, thinking about uh, quite a bit is uh, we have worked out certain examples. The question is how general is this? Uh, does this uh, construction work for all kinds of edge states uh, or you know, did we miss some where it doesn't work? And um, you know, edge states of higher order topological insulators, can you also describe these uh, using um, this construction? So, so that, that, those are some of the questions that I'm thinking about. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for paying attention. And um, yeah, and I'm happy to take questions. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for a nice presentation. Now we will have some time for questions. So if you have a question in the audience, please uh, raise the hand and we will go in order of those raised hands. And uh, maybe let me start with a question of my own first. So um, um, the question is about the following thing. So far you were considering uh, free theory, basically free Dirac theory, and all the interaction was only with this background field that you artificially uh, used to localize. Uh, now, um, of course, since this is topological, I assume that everything should remain true also in interacting theory. However, it seems like in interacting theory, you will have more than one loop uh, diagrams. Will the answer change? I expect it to not. So when I have these background, well, not just background, you could turn on uh, gauge fields that are dynamical as well. And um, I don't expect the result to change because of this, which I didn't discuss very much. Uh, so the Feynman diagram computes a map uh, uh, for uh, or the winding of a map, and uh, if you um, you know it, it's not going to change depending on what your interactions are doing unless you change parameters by. Um, but naively, you will have more than one loop uh, yeah. diagram to the calculation. At That's least naively, right. maybe I'm missing something. Naively, but they should all add up to, um, uh, yeah, integers is what I'm. Yeah. I see. I see. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay. Next question is Oleg uh, uh Thanks for a talk. And um, I have um, a question just to relate it to the uh, applicability of Feynman diagrams. And um, actually, it's known from uh, just uh, DUD uh, anomaly time. Uh, it's in the um, uh, well known lectures of Jacob that it's possible to, to, to calculate anomaly as a surface term in momentum space coming um, uh, because of the shift of integration variable. Is there any relation of um, just the map you discuss with this old example? So I am not familiar with the old example. Um, so I, wouldn't, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. 
Um, so just just because there is a divergent integral, if you make a shift of uh, integration variable, it produces the surface term in the at, at um, large uh, moment in momentum space, and this surface term is is calculable and provides the anomaly. So this is uh, this is the case. So it looks looks at least qualitatively um, having some similarity to that. Mm. Thanks. Okay. okay uh... Next question is Carl Weinsteiner. Hi. Hi. So, okay, hi, hi, hello. Yeah, thanks for the very nice talk. Yeah, I have uh, sort of two questions. One is, um, you mentioned, I mean, you, you mentioned this say two plus one dimensional topological insulator systems, et, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, or also probably, yeah, Three plus one dimensional topological insulator, I think you mentioned. Yeah, and I was then, discussing both of them, right? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so my impression was that for these type of systems, uh, there are so, there, there are some sort of global anomalies, which would tell you uh, the uh, edge state spectrum. Can you can you? Yeah. So for three plus one point? dimensional systems, I think you can. Um, uh, you can anticipate the presence of edge states uh, if you knew about, I mean, if, if you were considering parity anomaly, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, I don't think that has a direct relation to the construction that we created here. Mm -hmm. So typically, you know, there is the anomaly inflow argument, I think, for almost all sorts of edge states um, that we see in nature. Uh, it's just not the standard chiral anomaly current inflow picture. And so we wanted to create the, 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 an, an, an analog of this uh, uh, inflow picture that you see in case of when you have chiral anomaly on the walls. Um, but yes, there are, there, there are other anomaly inflow arguments uh, that can uh, help you um, sort of uh, discover edge states when you just know what is happening in the in the bulk right so yeah so there are there are uh, such uh, uh, such arguments for the for definitely there for three dimensional topological insulator three spatial dimensional topological insulator. Yeah, yeah. okay and if, if i can another question on just this slide you're showing on the coefficient of the transcendence term so the original calculation by Callan and Harvey, they actually, as far as I remember, they got like one half of this result, right? right? And my impression was that the fact that you get an integer uh, depends sort of the, the regularization. It, it, it's of course true that when you do a lattice regularization, you get, you get an integer. Right. But say, if you come from the continuum, is there a unique way of fixing that integer? In put, computing it is just you know, in a perturbative way with Feynman diagrams. Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah. So, yeah, you if you put in a polyvillars regulator. Um, right, but that, in that perturbation theory, up. for example, if I just look in perturbation theory, the number of polyvillars regulator fields is not fixed, right? Because usually you just want to cancel the divergences, and that doesn't tell you that you use one polyvillars regulator. You can choose many, and then you would choose different signs, and and that would. Yeah, so you have to choose the sign of the polyvillars mass. So yeah, right, right. So right. you have to be, you have to carefully choose the polyvillars mass in such a way that you get, um, you get vacuum on one side, and a non right. so, phase right. on the other right. side. Yeah. So yeah, depending on what you choose, one side will become, not you know the yeah. logical yeah. insulator, yeah. and the other one is vacuum. So yeah, yeah, it's not, I mean, it's not unique in that sense. So yeah, it's, there, there is some choice there. Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you, thank you. Thanks for the very nice talk. Um, okay, let's move to the next question, Simon Hans. Thank you, thank you for that very stimulating talk. Um, I'm a little puzzled and anxious because um, um, the, when you, you, you talk about doubling the the um, the fermion degrees of freedom, and that's if, is is there a distinction between that and simply working with four by four gamma matrices? 
because if if you do that, uh, that gives a that that describes a theory with with a with a decent uh, continuous flavor symmetry. And as far as I'm aware, no anomaly. And I'm wor I, I'm I, I you know this is actually related to the theories which I study using domain wall fermions. And I, I don't worry about it, um, current inflow at all. I just just get on with it. So I'm I'm, I'm trying to reconcile m m what I'm doing with with, with 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 what you've just told me. Um. So let me try to understand what you're asking a little bit better. So this is I, the double theory. Yeah. Right? And uh, my psi fields um, only depend on. Uh, these uh, coordinates x of the original theory, but their dimensions have been doubled. Yeah. So they don't depend on. So it's sort of like you, you had an extra dimension, but your fields didn't depend on that. Yeah, I mean, but th th this this is called three three dimensional fermions with reducible spinners. Yeah. It's, it yeah. has a u two yeah. n symmetry. Yeah? yeah. That's correct. So you can think of this as. Uh, some kind of flavor degrees of freedom, right? Mm -hmm. So there is, yeah, that's I think. Uh, but in that uh, case, it, it, is do I? Why do I need to worry about current inflow? Because th those theories aren't don't have anomalies. I can just yeah, they, they, So this theory actually doesn't have anomaly. <laughs> so yeah. I didn't. I didn't uh, maybe make that clear. The double theory uh, in that in the double theory, if you compute the the variance of the of the measure. It actually is zero, but I still have a current inflow picture, even though I don't have an anomaly on the wall. So, so it just relates the uh, the index. I've been e able to relate the index with a current inflow, uh, but that doesn't mean that I have actually an anomaly on the wall for this double theory. So you don't have to worry about anomaly here. Uh, yeah. Okay, I, I look forward to reading the details in your in your paper. Okay. Okay. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Um, um, before before we wrap this up, I, I actually had sort of very simple question, maybe even naive question. Uh, when you were dealing with the uh, with several of those examples, in the end, you had to choose some specific background field. Now, uh, my question is sort of related. Uh, it seemed like uh, to the to the choice of this field. It, in a way, it seemed um, random, or if you wish, uh, uh, there was no systematic choice of that background field how to use it so that you will find this uh, current. Uh, is there is there a specific um, way how you choose the background field? So, I mean that sort of relates to one of the. Uh, questions I had in my final slide um, is that can we always, are, I mean, can we always do this depending on what kind of system we have, edge states? And I don't have a general answer right now, but I would say that if you have an index theorem for your original theory, then you can use that um, to be able to write down the gauge field configurations that will give you. Um, the, yeah, this this current. Um, I don't know if it's going to work for every case. Um, okay, okay, I see. Um, anyway, I don't see any other questions uh, from the audience, so I'll use this opportunity uh, to once again thank you uh, for a very nice presentation. Thanks.